full of the goodness of God, the mercy and the grace and the love of God. And my, I have only one purpose in life, and that is to bring the treasure out that is in people. It's the most important thing for me is to, that you discover uh, the reality of the life of Christ that's in you, your destiny. And you discover that you are very special and that you are the beloved of God. And that if you can discover that, your life will be completely different. And uh, if, you, if you know my background, where I come out of, um, I, I'm going to try not to be long today. Um, but uh, I grew up in South Africa in a place called Okip in a semi-desert. And my dad, was, my dad worked in the copper mines. And at the age of five, I saw rain for the first time. Uh, we did not have rain, rain for a long, long, long time. There was kids who were seven, eight years of age who saw rain. And, and the semi-desert changed into a flower garden in, uh, in a matter of days. And um, what was so beautiful is that when I... In 1996, when I found the message of grace and I found the, the, the revelation of righteousness and innocence in me, God shows me that in me was a seed that was dormant. And the seed was Christ. And it was dormant in me. Not that Christ is not alive, but it was dormant in my heart. You understand what I mean by that? And he took me back to that and he said, Peter, seeds were lying under the ground for seven, eight years. And when the rain came on it, it awakens. And uh, that's my heart's desire wherever I go, that the life of Christ that is in you awaken in your heart and in your mind. And uh, that you begin to try, uh, live that reality. Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I want to share with you, um, which I call uh, in my sermon, if you got your Bibles or your smartphones or whatever, I want to share with you on, I call it moving on to perfection. How many of you want to be perfect? I see two, three people here. <laughs> but I call it moving on to perfection. And it says it in uh, Hebrews 6. It says, leaving the elementary principles of Christ, let us move on to perfection, not laying again the, the foundation of uh, um, uh, 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 repenting from dead works towards faith. So this morning I want to encourage you, and if you first turn with me to uh, Hebrews 8, and I want to read the first verse to you there, where he say, um, in verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. Have you ever seen that in the Bible? He says, now this is the main point of the things which we are saying. The main point. We want to talk about the main point today. <laughs> And if we can find the main point of what, what Paul is saying here, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, it just looks very much like his character. And then he say here, what we are saying, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And he says, this is the main point that I want to make today to you guys. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the majesty. And the reality of that is, is that how many of you know that Jesus sat down? He is seated on the right hand of the Father. Now, if he sat down, then it means he's not working anymore. <laughs> the work is done. The work is finished. That's what it means that Jesus sat down. And he says, this is the main point of the things, is that we as children of God needs to come into rest. Because Jesus, when he sat down, that moment that he sat down on the cross, the work uh, on the, the cross, excuse me, on the throne, the work was done. The work was finished. Um, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and he died, he finished with sin, he finished with uh, sickness, he finished with the curse, he finished death. But the wonderful thing of that is three days later, he rose from the dead. The Bible says we rose with him from the dead. We are seated with him in heavenly places. So in reality, the audience that I'm talking here to this morning, you are supposed to be seated down with Christ and not working anymore or labor or perform to try to get anything from God. And when it means that it, the reality of you being seated with Christ means that you rest now in the finished work of Jesus Christ and you got it all. Amen. Amen. 
The fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, and you are complete in him. Colossians uh, 2, verse 1, uh, 9 and 10. So, reality, the thing what I want to talk to you about is, so many Christians struggle to come into rest. So many Christians struggle to, to live from that position where we rest and just experience the life of Christ uh, manifesting through us and being led by the Spirit of God, not struggling or laboring or in hardships in life and that we are actually filled with the peace of Christ. Jesus said, I give you my peace, not as the world give you, but I give you my peace. And I remember uh, before I found grace in 1996 how performance driven I was. I was an absolute religious pastor who was performance driven and I was um, negative. And uh, finally I come to the end of myself. <laughs> and that was the best place to be. And when I came to the end of myself, I wanted to resign from ministry. I told God, I said, I'm done with you and I'm done with the church and I'm done with Christianity. And I want to live on an island with Rottweilers trained to bite Christians. <laughs> and, and I want to be on my own there. And that's how I really felt like I was just on the end of myself. And then uh, I met Arthur Manches uh, in Brazil. We went on an outreach. And when I met Arthur, this man began to share with me stuff that I didn't even know was written in the Bible. And I said, can that really be God that loved me unconditionally? It got absolutely nothing against me. And that was the beginning of the journey, and it was really uh, a wonderful journey. We've learned a lot. But today I'm at a place that I just want the body of Christ, that they rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, understand who they are in Christ, and that they live from that fullness or the overflow of that fullness. How many of you want to live there? Now we're going to touch on, we're going to touch on one little thing that holds people back. And we're going to work on that this morning. Can we do that? Yes. So if you turn with me in your Bible, and I'm going to read to you, um, in, uh, we're going to stand still in Hebrews today. So the first verse I'm going to read to you is in Hebrews 10, and then we're going to take it from there. And that is in verse, um, let's read from verse 19, um, and we, then we backtrack from there. He says, therefore having boldness to enter the holiness, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. We're going to explain some awesome, awesome things about that. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Say evil conscience. Evil conscience. Okay. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession <coughs> of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Now what I want to stand still here this morning is an evil conscience. So let's explain what is an evil conscience. Can we do that? Because many, uh, all of you sitting here, I believe, is born again. All of you sitting here believe in Jesus Christ. The audience that I'm talking here today, here is nobody here that don't believe in Jesus. All of you believe in Jesus. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you agree with me that your spirit is born again. You have, you are a new creation according to first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are now a new creation. Amen. Isn't that awesome? The old is gone. Amen. Behold, the new has come. That means that your spirit is born again. It is created in the image of Jesus Christ. But the problem that we have in the body of Christ today is a heart problem. It got nothing to do with your spirit. Many people say, I give my heart to Jesus Christ. No, you did not give your heart to Jesus Christ. What you did is, is that you have been born again by his spirit. And Ezekiel explained it so beautiful. He say, and I will I will give you a new spirit and I will take the heart of stone out of you and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now I want to stand still on heart this morning. Your heart is not your spirit. Many people think their spirit is their heart. It's not your spirit. Your heart is a combination of everything in your being. Jesus used that word and he says cardia and cardia is a Greek word exists of two words. Car means the center and source of your whole being, and dia is where you act from. So your heart is the place where you act from automatically. That's what it is. And in uh, uh, Proverbs 4.23, the writer of Proverbs says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. 
So the life that you live right now or where you are in life right now is because of what you believe in your heart. <clears throat> really. With the heart we believe. So if we can change the beliefs in our heart, everything will change. As he is, as he think in his heart, so is he. So I always love to use this as a foundation. Now here we come in Hebrews, and what is interesting in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 3, and I want to read that to you, he say there in verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. Say evil heart. How many of you agree with me he is speaking to believers? The book of Hebrews is believers. This is Hebrews who came to Jesus, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened is now suddenly they are influenced by the law. So he said, beware, Brennan, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now the word evil, this is where I want to stand still. I wonder if you can give me a description. If you know the Greek word, please don't say it. But <laughs> or the expl if you have to think of the word evil today, it gives you an idea in your mind. It's, it's, you would think it's a very bad person who do bad things. But the word evil actually in the original Greek is poneros. And it's very easy to get that word. <laughs> because that word, uh, you can go into Strong's Concordance and you will find it. The word poneros means labors, hardships, annoyances. That's what it means, toiling. So when the Bible talk about evil, it talk about a person whose heart is programmed to perform. Mm -hmm. It's a, pro, a person who is, when he say you have an evil heart of unbelief, he is talking to believers who have Christ in them, but their hearts were influenced with the reality that now they have to perform to get God to love them or to get God to bless them. They're trying to improve themselves. They're into self-effort. How many of you have ever lived there? The wonderful of the grace message is that it brings you into rest. And the wonder of it is that it first tells you, the first thing, I remember the first thing that I learned about grace, of the message of grace is, um, which I never saw, and Arthur Manchus began to explain that to me, is that God got absolutely nothing against me. And when I discover that God got absolutely nothing against me, suddenly I realize I don't have to perform anymore. I don't have to do any good thing to get God to love me anymore. Isn't that awesome? Now, now if we go on here, say evil. If we go on here into um, Hebrews uh, 8 and 9, and we jump over to verse, um, excuse me, uh, 9 and 10, and we jump over to chapter 10 and we read from verse 1 now listen to this for the law having a shadow of the good things to come so the law was only a shadow and not the very image of the things can never with these sacrifices which they offer continually year by year those who approach perfect or perfect them for then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. Now how many of you remember that I said to you an evil conscience or a consciousness of sins? The, the biggest problem today in general in the body of Christ is that people have a sin conscience. And a sin conscience is a, is a horrible place to be in. Uh, I meet so many children of God that is born again. They come to church Sunday. They worship God. They read their Bible. They pray regularly. They love people. But they live under a sin conscience. And if you have a sin conscience, then you are into labor and you are into works. And your heart is actually established in performance. And Jesus has come. And I want to read further on your... Um, in uh, uh, Hebrews 10, so just say to the guy next to you, it's going to get better, don't worry. We are just laying a foundation here. <laughs> okay, and then he say here in Hebrews 10, and this is what I want to read to you from verse 11. And every priest stands, say stand. stand. If someone stands, that means he still works. 
<laughs> and every priest stand ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Then he say, but this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down. Say one sacrifice. One sacrifice. See, See, sins has been dealt with once for, uh, for, uh, forever by one sacrifice. Yes. If you have a sin conscience, you will struggle to function in faith. Always struggle to function in faith. Because some of you, would, if, if you have a sin conscience, you will easily fall for teachings where people say, um, you have to build up your faith. You need to get greater faith. You will always have the idea in you that you don't have enough faith when you have a sin conscience. That's the big problem in this thing. That's why he say, be, beware lest any of you have an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. And an evil heart, a, a heart that is programmed in works and labors, a person whose heart is established in that struggle in his faith walk. And what happened is the moment that you understand that Jesus has once for all take away your sins. In that moment that that re revelation hit your heart and your mind. Guess what happened? The faith that is already in you. Yes. Okay, I want to say it again. Yeah. You already have faith. Amen. You don't have to work faith up. You don't have to get greater faith. Now in the Bible we see that Jesus... Jesus never, did you know that Jesus never said you must have great, great faith? He honored people who had great faith. But he says, if you have faith like a little mustard seed, <laughs> you can say to this mountain, you just need a little bit of faith. But in the new covenant, Jesus was still speaking to people under the old covenant when he said that. But in the new covenant, Jesus Christ is our faith. Yes. Amen. That's why he say in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we say, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Test yourself or are you not sure that Jesus Christ is in you? So if Jesus Christ is in you, you are in the faith of God. Yes. Amen. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Paul say in Galatians 2, 20, Paul say, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that live anymore. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. The old King James Version is the only translation that put it right. It says, by the faith, because they quote the Greek in its original form. It says, by the faith of Christ. He says, I'm crucified with Christ, not I live anymore, but Christ live in me. And the life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of Christ, who gave himself for me because he loved me. And Paul is talking in the context of righteousness there. He talk about the... Con and then he say, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, Christ died in vain. So what is he saying? He say, he say I'm, not try I'm not trying to be righteous anymore. I've been made righteous. So I, I am, I'm not trying to live a faith life or try to build up my faith to become righteous. I am righteous because of the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Jesus went to the cross with faith, with his faith. With his faith, he made you righteous. Yes. You cannot make yourself righteous. He made you righteous by his faith. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. So I just want to lay that as a foundation and, and say to you this morning, you have faith. You have the faith of God. And the way that it is jump start in you is the moment that you understand that you are innocent. In that moment that you understand, I am as innocent as Jesus is right now. In that moment, faith is ignited in you and, the spirit, and you become alive to the Spirit of God. He say, because he said that if you have an evil heart of unbelief, you depart from the living God. It doesn't mean that God leaves you. God is still in you, but in your mind and your heart, you have departed from the life of God. And now you are functioning on your own ability and your own strength. Okay, let's talk about sin a little bit. How many of you want us that we just kill that cow here yeah. this morning and just so that you can feel better? What does sin really mean? The word sin in the Greek is hamartia. And hamartia is, is a noun. It's not a verb. It's a thing. <laughs> so that means it, it refers to something. So it refers to your nature. So if we say... 
If we confess our sins, that word in the Greek is amartia. If we confess that we have a sin nature, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Now that word forgive in the Greek is divorce. He's faithful and just to divorce you from that nature and purify you and make you righteous. That's a one-time event. Yeah, and many people think they have to keep on confessing their sins every time they make a mistake. You cannot do that. It's impossible because God has given you a righteous nature, an innocent nature, once for all. Amen. Yes. Yep. And now you are not a sinner anymore. Now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So what happened to Adam? When Adam ate from that tree, what happened to Adam? The word for, for sin means to miss the mark. In, in the original Greek, it means to miss the mark. It means that that moment when he ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened is the word evil, you guys agree with me, is poneros, which means labors, works, toiling. He put himself into performance mode. He put himself into toiling. Now, how many of you know that Adam was created in the image of God? That he had an absolute view and opinion of who God think he is. He was like God. Yep. You agree with me on that? Yep. So when he ate from that tree, what, what happened? He suddenly separated himself from the quality of God's life. That's what he did. Adam didn't smoke marijuana in the, in the garden. Maybe he did. I don't know. There was trees and leaves there. I don't know. He wasn't drunk. He didn't do anything bad. He just ate from that tree. That's all that he did. <laughs> Are you with me? And evil means he fall into labor. He forfeited the quality of God's life. That's what he did. Isn't that horrible? And now he wants to live up to a standard that is good enough. Can I tell you something? All your good works and all your labor and all your toiling will never make you good enough. You cannot become good enough by all your labors and all your... You cannot. The only thing that you can do is, is to stop working and resting. This man sat down. His name is Jesus Christ. We are seated with him. That means you cannot work anymore. <laughs> Isn't that true? See, if you are in self-effort, then you try to improve what Jesus has perfected. Okay, I'm going to say it again. If you are in self-effort, you are trying to improve what Jesus has perfected. Say, I'm perfected. Okay, I'm going to prove to you that you are perfected. Can I do that? Hebrews 10. Listen to this. I'm going to read from verse 12 again. For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He rested. He don't stand anymore. He's not doing any sacrifices. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his foot, footstool. For by one offering, say one offering, one he has perfected. Isn't that beautiful? By one offering, He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Isn't that beautiful? For by one offering, He has perfected you. So what, what, what does it mean to be perfected? Listen to what He says in chapter, in chapter 10 verse 1. I already, and 2, I read that to you. He said, if the priests by their offerings would have been perfected, they had no more sin conscience. So what does it mean to be perfected as a child of God? It means that you have no more sin conscience anymore. Won't you think that is awesome that you can go every day into life, woke up in the morning knowing that I am as innocent as Jesus is? And then go into life and your heart is established in that innocence? Now, now the word righteousness, and I, and I, and I just want to stand a little bit still on that word, uh, on righteousness. Righteousness means that I stand before God just as if I've never sinned. I don't like to use the word righteousness. Um, because many people, if they hear the word righteousness, they immediately make it to an old covenant connotation under the law. Because um, the Jews trying to establish their own righteousness through their own good works and trying to live up to a standard. 
So I don't really like to use that word righteousness because it's actually an old covenant word. In the new covenant, the Greek word for it is not really righteous. It actually means different because under the old covenant, the word righteousness was the beam of a scale, which means you have to balance it out with your good works. You are down here and with your good works, you balance it out. And if you fail in it, then you are back to square one. But under the new covenant, the word righteousness actually means when two beings find equal likeness in one another. Isn't that beautiful? Therefore, we are transformed when we look into the image of Jesus Christ. We are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. How many of you agree with me that Jesus is right now innocent? So if we found equal likeness, then we are innocent. (laughs) <laughs> God don't want you to work. Here's what God wants you to do <laughs> under the new covenant. People say, so you say I, haven't, I, I, I mustn't do anything anymore. Now let me explain it to you. The new covenant, and I love to quote this verse. In Romans 8 he says, What shall we say of all these things of God is for us who can be against us? He who did not spare his only begotten son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not with him give us all things? Say all things. And the new covenant you receive. (laughs) It's all about receiving. Everything that you need, you is already in Christ in you. That is what Paul said to the Philippians. This is what Paul said to the Philippians. He says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. We have received everything in Christ to live an abundant, overflowing, miraculous, victorious life right now. Not one day when we go to heaven or one day when this is over here. No, right right now. I want to encourage you that you must rest in Christ And when you begin to rest in His finished work and understand that you are not a sinner, that you are absolutely being set free from a sin conscience and that Jesus has made you innocent and righteous and that He justified you. Guess what? The life of God begins to flow. Jesus, Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you believe in me, streams of living water will come from your belly. Did, Did He mean... That you believe in Him seated on the right hand of the Father. Yes, that too. But you know what it means to me? It means to me when I believe that Jesus Christ in me is my righteousness and my innocence and my holiness and my sanctification. That's my new nature. When I believe that, streams of living water will come from my belly. Isn't it beautiful? I love that. That's why I say that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, I'm looking unto Christ in me. He's the beginning and the end of my faith. He is the faith of God inside of me, which make it so beautiful. So therefore, we believe with the heart. So what needs to happen with me and you? We need to reprogram the heart. And the only way that you can reprogram the heart is by the renewing of the mind. By begin to think different. That's why Jesus say, when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus say, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent, and that word repent in the Greek is metanoia, which means to think different, to renew your mind, and believe the gospel. So what needs to happen with us is, we need to begin to think different. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to to impart in our hearts and write on our minds the reality of who we really are. Because so many Christians, uh, uh, believers today in the body of Christ, they are just living. They are just going. It's like a status quo. They just go through things. Because their hearts is programmed to work and to labor. Now you would say to me, Peter, so I'm not doing anything. No. Here's what I want to say to you. Jesus said, I can do nothing unless my Father shows me. (laughs) So what happens if your heart is established in the grace of God, your heart is open and sensitive to the voice of God. And now you are being led by the Spirit of God. How many of you would rather want to work for God, to get God to bless you, or understand that you are already blessed and being led by the Spirit of God? It's a different different lifestyle. Do you agree with me on that? 
I rather being led by the Spirit of God, knowing that I have everything in Christ, that I've been perfected, that I'm not a sinner, hallelujah, <laughs> that I've been made righteous, and that, that I, because of that I have a right to the promises in the kingdom of God, than to work and to be deceived by the idea to work and labor for God, to get something from God, to work and labor trying to be good enough. So here's what I want to say to you this morning. You are already good enough. Amen. Say to the person next to you, you are good enough. Because Jesus made you good enough. And that is what is so wonderful about this. Um, <clears throat> I remember when I was a, a younger Christian, um, uh, I think what I need to do is, is, is first swing you guys over and just show you something else in, in Romans. So you guys got the concept now that, that you understand what it means that if you are free of a sin conscience, then it means you are, you've been perfected. And if you are free of a sin conscience, then it means your heart is free of labor from the idea that you have to perform. And now your heart is sensitive to God. That's why Ezekiel say, I will take the heart of God will take the heart of stone of you and give you and will give you a heart of flesh. In the Hebrew, that word flesh uh, is actually naked. So God said, I will give you a naked heart. <laughs> and naked means innocent. How many of you know? <laughs> Children, they don't mind. They are so innocent. They just their clothes off. They stand there naked. I mean, they 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 have an innocence in there that they don't even care about anything. Isn't that amazing? There's such a powerful thing around innocence. And, uh, you know, I, I went to a, a friend of mine, invite me one day to have lunch with him uh, at his company. And they have a, a buffet for all the workers uh, 12, during lunch hour. And all the workers came in there and they have a buffet. And he invited me to have buffet with them there. And I was early waiting, sitting there and people, everything was ready. And a big guy walked in there. And he said to the chef, I'm hungry, can I eat early? And the chef said, no, you can't eat now. He says, why can't I, why can't I have my meal now? He, he says, no, the rule is you can't. The rule is we eat 12 o'clock. He says, listen, man, I'm hungry. <laughs> and the guy said, no, that's the rule. I didn't make the rule. You can't eat now. You, and and I, that big guy was later on upset, you know. He, said, he couldn't understand it. He, why can't I have like 10 minutes before the time I meal? And the chef stood on his ground and says, no, you're not going to eat now. So you better leave. So the guy walked out very upset. And two, three minutes later, here comes this little boy walking in. And he walked up to the fridge, opened the fridge, and the chef saw him. And the chef ran up to him and the chef said, hey, buddy, can I help you? And uh, he says, yes, I'm hungry. Can I have some? He says, yes, come help yourself. <laughs> help yourself here with the buffet. What, you need a yogurt? You need anything here? And uh, he, he gave it to the young boy. And I sit there and I said, Father, what happened here? And the Lord said to me, that's exactly how the law and innocence work. Now, here's the point that I want to make us. It's impossible to say no to someone who is innocent. How many of you know it's very difficult to say no to your kids? <laughs> I mean, if they ask ridiculous things that is way out there. I mean, you won't give your kid a gun. You agree with me? Yeah. A loaded gun, you will never do that. But innocence is so powerful. And God has given us that innocence. That's why Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it unto you. Why? Because... You are declared innocent. But it's when we are into works and into labors that we block our own hearts off from the blessing of God. Because here's what I want to say to you. You are already blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. If your heart is established in innocence, the blessing keep on flowing. Amen. It, keep, it never stops. You are not cursed. You are blessed. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Amen. Now, I want to show you in, in, in Romans 2 how it looks when your heart, uh, when your heart is, is, is established in, in uh, an evil conscience or a sin conscience. Can I do that? Turn with me to Romans 2. How many of you agree with me here today? We are actually, we didn't grow up in a Jewish culture. We grew up as Gentiles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we are born again. But we were all Gentiles or pagans or whatever you can call it. Amen. So listen to this in uh, Romans 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. He says, For when Gentiles 
who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law. Isn't that interesting? This is Gentiles. They didn't grow up in a Jewish culture. <laughs> Let's go on here. Do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Now, how many of you know what the law is? He talk about the law of Moses here. Amen. He's talking about, he's talking about when, when Israel was on the mountain, when God appeared to them at the mountain, they ran away from, from the presence of God. Why did they? If I study the fire of God through the Bible, then I see that fire is actually love. But they were not generated in their nature. That's why they couldn't handle that fire. That's why they ran away. And they say to Moses, Hey Moses, listen, what? you talk to God and whatever God say we will do. Does that, doesn't that sound interesting? <laughs> whatever God say we will do. So God said, okay, all right, I'm going to give you the law. I have to, you don't have faith, so I'm going to give you something to do. So he gave them the law. And the law, if, if they couldn't live up to the standard of the law, guess what the Bible says? You are cursed. Am I right or am I wrong? If you can live up to the standard of the law, you are blessed. But here he is Gentiles who never heard the law. And he say, and, and listen to what he say here. He goes on and he say, um, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. When was the law written in their hearts? They are Gentiles. You still with me? Now listen to this. Their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing them or else excusing them. Isn't that interesting? He say their own conscience is accusing them. Where did they, where did the, where did the Gentiles get the law from? He says their nature, say nature. nature. Where did they get that? They got it from Adam. Because when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, can I tell you what? That is the law. <laughs> and that was established in the nature of every human being. You look at the people out in the world there, their nature is established in the law because it came from Adam. The knowledge of, the good, of, the knowledge of good and evil is in their nature. And it is accusing them. Their own conscience is accusing them. And that's what happened with believers who heard the gospel, who is saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, but Sunday when they come to church, then they hear, you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, or else you will not be blessed. Then they mix the gospel, the gospel with the law in their hearts, and that is worse than a person who is just under the law, or a person who is just under grace. To be in between, to have a heart, the evil heart of unbelief, that means you have the gospel in your heart. That's a double-minded man. A double-minded man is a man who has the gospel in his heart and he has the law in his heart. It is a mixture in him. That's why Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So you need to be free. You need your heart to be purified from any form of the law of Moses because the law has no relevance in your life. You are not supposed to live by the law because the Bible says in Romans 10, 4 that Jesus is the end of the law. He abolishes the law. He finishes the law. Now, some of you would say to me, whoa, 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 Peter, let me just remind you a little bit here. Hebrews 10, uh, from verse 15, uh, 16, 15, 16, and 17 says, God says, this is the covenant I will make with you. I will put my laws in your heart and I will write it in your mind and I will not remember your sins anymore. He's not saying the laws of Moses. He says it's the laws of God. What is the laws of God? Jump over to James 1, where he talk about the perfect Law of liberty. Okay, let me say it again. The perfect law of liberty. Who is the perfect law of liberty? Jesus Christ himself that is living inside of us. Or Paul would say in Romans 8, he would say the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Come on. So you need to purify your heart from all works. So the first thing that the Christian needs to do is, is to cease and stop working. You have to stop working for God and all heaven will go into hallelujah, hallelujah and praising the Father. The moment when you say, Father, I give up, I stop working now. Really? You need to cease, man. You need to relax. You need to chillax. 
That means you chill out and you relax. Really, that's the first thing that you need to do. And you need to come into the rest of the Father and, 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 and sit down and say, Father, show me any form of work, any form of toiling, any form of performance that is in me to get the acceptance of man and of you. Because how many of you agree with me if you go into the world right now? The world is all about performance. You perform in your work, you perform in school, you perform in university. Everything you do is to perform to get somewhere in life or to get the acceptance. God wants you to relax and understand that you are already accepted in the beloved. Amen. <laughs> See, the, there come a voice from heaven uh, uh, when Jesus was baptized and he came out of the baptism waters. There came a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that Jesus was a son of the father that he was pleased in before he do any miracle? Before he did any miracle, before he cast out the devil, before he multiplied the bread, before he loved people, before he did anything. He was a son that was loved by the Father. And Ephesians 1 say that we are in the beloved. God is pleased with you. So relax. Sit down and say, Holy Spirit, show me anything in my heart that is works related, that is toiling related, that I have to perform for acceptance for man and from God. And just rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and understand that you are accepted. The moment that you do that, the moment that you relax and you sit down and the Holy Spirit begin to bring revelation knowledge to your heart and show you that you are already the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That you have already been declared innocent. That you have already been justified. See Paul, see what's amazing to me about Paul. Uh, he wrote to the Corinthians. How many of you know that uh, the Corinthians was a really church that was messed up yeah. how many of you know that yeah. but something interesting he's what he say to them he say to them you are washed you are sanctified you are justified in the lord jesus christ and those is a arrestus uh excuse it's it's a it's a i think it's a arrestus indica, indicative in the greek so so that means in the greek it means it is something that is already done and it's something that you can do nothing about it is finished that's what it means in the greek so uh, in in reality what it means is he say to them you are washed it is something that happened in the past uh, in the past and it is done you didn't do it he say you are washed you are sanctified you are justified in the midst of all that trouble that he address he tell them here's what i want to tell you this is who you really are <laughs> And he just bring them back to the reality of who they are. And what are we doing today in the body of Christ when we preach the message of grace? We just bring people back to the reality of who they are. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are absolutely created in the image of Jesus Christ. When the Father look at you, the Bible says, God don't remember your sins anymore. So every time that you go and confess your sins, you try to remind God of something that He can't remember. Amen. Am I right or am I wrong? It's right. So people say, but what do I do when I make a mistake, Peter? It's very easy. You can't say to God, I'm a sinner. Because God don't see you as a sinner. God sees you as righteous. So the only thing that you can do is, is to confess you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because what you do is you bring your heart, say heart. You bring your heart above the circumstances when you open your mouth and begin to say who you are. Because if you say, oh, I'm such a sinner, I'm so bad, look what I've done again. You bring your heart in agreement with what is going on around you. And you bring your, your you subject your spirit, you bring the depression on you. But if you confess and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, guess what? You bring your heart above that circumstance circumstances and guess what it's not about what you do it's about right believing and when you begin to believe right remember what i say to you in the beginning your heart is kar diha the center and source where you act from so if you in the center and source of your life if you begin to believe right guess what you're going to act right thank you for your enthusiasm you may sit down now <laughs> you know are you with me it's a matter of believing right. It's not a matter of doing right. In the new covenant, there's not such a thing as right and wrong. There's only truth. 
Go and read it. There's no, no one place in the New Covenant that it talk about right and wrong. It only talk about truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What is the truth? Is that God say, come on man, don't go down to that level. You are my son. That's the truth. <laughs> you are my child. That's the truth. You've been born from my house. Oh, I love that. Okay. Are you still with me? <laughs> I'm going to close, close down with this. I don't want to talk too much. I, I can just go on and on. <clears throat> I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Sometimes I wonder, I go home and I say, Father, what did I do this morning? <clears throat> so here's what I want to encourage you. The first verse, the verses that I read to you and I close down with this in, in Hebrews 10 verse 19. Before I read that, I also need to say this to you. I'm a little bit all over the place this morning. But here's what I want to show to you is, sin is not destructive living. It's really not sin. That is the works of the flesh. That means you have submitted your heart so far under performance and legalism and toiling. Your heart is so deeply programmed that on the end of the day, the works of the flesh become evident in you. And it manifests into destructive living. But that doesn't make you a sinner. Paul don't say to those people they are sinners. He reminded them in the book of Galatians who they are. They are. are you with me? Yes. And if you have destructive living in your life right now, guess what? Let's go back to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is deep down in your heart, you have a performance-based mentality. And you struggle with acceptance. And now you have a void in you. And now you try to fill that void with all kinds of other junk. But that's not who you are. That void is your heart. But the Holy Spirit have the power. Oh man, I love that. Because Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. Isn't that yes. beautiful? Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, just don't throw us out in the world and say, Hey guys, there's a bunch of words and here's my Bible and go and do it. He didn't do that. He says, I give you the Holy Spirit as a helper. He's going to be with you forever. Never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe. The world, say the world. Yeah. You're not of the world. And then he say, and he's going to convict you of righteousness. See, the Holy Spirit will never agree with you when you mess up and say, I'm such a sinner. He, he's going to say nothing. He's just going to say, no, sorry, you are righteous. <laughs> it's reality. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let, let's just get your heart out of this, this, sorry for the word, this crap that you believe. Yes. Let's just get your heart out of the stuff that you got down there. That, that's re deep down there where you try to, to, to perform to, to get acceptance. Let's just get that out of and rest and relax because you are already accepted in the Father. You are already accepted in the Beloved. Okay, now I'm going to close down with this because one day when I read this, it really changed me. And I tell you why. Because from verse 19 right down there to verse 25 was my procedure that I followed before I found grace. I did it every morning of my life. He says here, with boldness you can come into the Holy of Holies through the blood of the Lamb. And then I would come and confess all my sins. And I confess even the dog and the cat's wrongdoings. And, and the whole household, because we need to get everything pure now. And now I can come, uh, and, and then I say to myself, on a new and living way. And then I, uh, I go through the whole tabernacle. How many of you did that? I go through the whole tabernacle thing, through the outer court, and where Jesus uh, sat sacrifice his life for me and I'm at the wash basin I say Jesus thank you your word washes me and now I go into the holy place where I worship you and I read the word and all that things and then I go into the now I feel good and when I feel good then I think God feel good and now I can go into the holy of holies and I can hang out with God and it was too and then later in the day I make a mistake and then I say oh my gosh now God have left me now I have to go through the whole thing again and then one day one day when I found grace I went through this passage again and this is what the Lord showed me and I want to close down. He says, therefore, brethren, he's talking to people that's under the law, that have accepted Jesus, that is now influenced by the law. That's the people that he's talking to. You agree with me on that? That's the Hebrews. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews. Hebrews 10 verse 19. He says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Here's what I want to say to you. What holiness is he talking about? Is that is he talking about the 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 the, the tabernacle? Is he talking about heaven? 
I don't think so. I don't think so. When I begin to read, study it through and through in the book of Hebrews, God said to me, your, your spirit is the holy of holiest. And He says, in your minds you've been darkened. And I'm encouraging you to enter in and stay there. Focused. What did I say to you? Hebrews 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. What he's trying to do through this whole thing is bring them into rest and that they look at Christ in them, the author and finisher of faith in them. So he says, enter the holiest, which is your spirit man. Enter the holiest through the blood of the Lamb. What does He mean by the blood of the Lamb? Must Jesus do a sacrifice again? He's no. The blood speaks. The blood got a voice. The blood say you are righteous. The blood say you are innocent. Come on. Jesus don't shed His blood anymore. But the blood speaks for the last 2,000 years. Amen. Telling every human being. You are holy. You are sanctified. You are washed. Yes. So that's what he's saying to them. Come through the blood. That your conscience being sanctified. That your conscience being free of a sin conscience. Come into the Holy of Holies with boldness. Enter to that place. You need to become confident and bold. That I am a son of God. And the spirit of God is dwelling in me. And I live from that place. Amen. Are you still with me? Yes. Okay. You're not going through a tabernacle setup yet. And then he say, on a new and living way, which he, say, which, uh, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. The new and living way speaks of the covenant, the new covenant, not the old covenant anymore. It's a new and living way through Christ Jesus and through the veil, which is his flesh. Wow, I stand still on that one. I said, what does that mean, Jesus? And the Lord said to me, how many of you know there's another veil? <laughs> there was a veil under the old covenant. And when they look at that veil, what did that veil say to them? You're condemned, buddy. You can't come into the Holy of Holies. That's what that veil told them. You remember that? The priest have to follow the whole procedure. And if he made a mistake, that's why at the stage they would put a rope around his ankle or his waist when he go into the Holy of Holies. And if they don't hear the bells ring inside there anymore, they know he's dead. And after they have waited for quite a while, they would pull him out and they would pull his dead body out. He died in the presence of God because he didn't follow the procedure. So that every Jewish person who was living in that culture, when he looked at that veil, it tells him something. It tells him, you are not good enough to enter in here. That's what he told him. The same with the veil of Moses that he hang over his face. Now, I preached about it last night. I said to the people, people think that that glory that was shining from Moses' face was something good. It was not good. Because the word glory means view and opinion. That's what glory means. Go and study. Doxa means view and opinion. God has a good view and opinion of you. Isn't it true? But if you read the law, it have no good view and opinion of you. Because the law is the knowledge of sin. And the law is the strength of sin. And the law shows you you are weak. So that's why when they look into the face of Moses, it had a glory. Because the law was holy. And the law was perfect. It was. But it couldn't help you. It just condemns you. So that's why they, he had to hang a, a thing over his face. Because they couldn't look into that glory that condemns them. But if they look into Jesus Christ, it's acceptance. The glory of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? So, so the point that I want to make here is he says that we can go through the veil which is His flesh. Oh man, that speaks of a lot of things. What does that say? It means that Jesus died on the cross. And when you look at the cross, what do you see? All sin and condemnation and judgment is removed. It all came upon Him and not upon us. And if we look at His, at his flesh, which is now the veil. So if anything say to me, you can't live from that position. Then I say, sorry, Jesus Christ took my place. Are you with me? Jesus died in my place. Jesus took the condemnation. I am not condemned. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> That's the veil. And then, in, and then if we have to take it further this morning, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 17, the Bible say, As He is, so we are in this world. Right now on the right hand of the Father, sit a man. It's not a spirit that sit there, it's a man. 
It's a man that came out of the grave. It's not a spirit. Isn't that awesome? That's why we can sit down. We have someone that we identify with in the presence of God because he's a man. And as he is, so we are in this world. We identify with his flesh. So as he is, so we are in this world. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, let's go on here. So the veil, that there's no more veil hanging over my heart. The only thing that the, 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 that veil had a voice telling them they are condemned. But this veil, which is his flesh, say no, you are justified. You are forgiven. You are innocent. There's nothing that will hold you to live in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. And then he, say, um, uh, 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 he says, having a high priest over the house of God, that means that Jesus keep this covenant forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then he said, let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So what he is saying here is, he say, when you come to the conclusion that you are being made innocent through the blood of Jesus Christ, your heart is set free of an evil conscience. That means that works mentality. And now you can rest. And you can sit down in the presence of God and you can begin to experience life. And you can experience an intimate relationship with the Father and Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning for every person here. We just thank you, Lord, that, that, we, don't, that we don't have a sin conscience anymore because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That we are not condemned anymore because of your righteousness. We just thank you, Father, this morning that that we don't have to ask you to come and fill this place. You are already here. And we give you glory for that, Father. We give you praise as we honor you. We just lift you up this morning in our hearts. And we just say, thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus Christ to set us free of all sin, from all condemnation, from all guilt, from all um, uh, uh, um, uh, destructive living. And we just praise you this morning that your life is in us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are in this place. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you know us better than we know ourselves. And you know where the root of all problems is. And we give you glory. And we praise you for that this morning. And all God's people say, Amen.